In this video, I wanted just to give you a guided tour of the LabJack device, these red boxes we have around the lab, and what they're used for. So the first thing you notice about the LabJack device is that it's a USB device. If you look carefully at it here, there's a USB connector right here, which we have a USB cable plugged into, and it goes to the other end, a USB slot here, which you can plug into a computer. So for some odd reason, this red box can be plugged into the USB port on a computer. But here's what it does. It's not a digital camera, it's not a video camera, it's not something like that. But if you look at the front of it here, it has all kinds of hookup wire opportunities on it here. Let me get this out of the way and I'll explain what that is in a minute, but just a quick tour of it right here. What you see on the lab jack is a bunch of jacks labeled AI0, AI1, ground, AI2, AI3, and so on. AI stands for analog input. So this means analog input zero, analog input one. And you see that these, there's seven of these channels right here. So what that means that the LabJack does, at least on this face right here, is it allows you to, to take in up to eight channels of analog input type signals. Now when you hear the word analog in electronics, you're definitely thinking of, an, of a signal that may be something like a sine wave or a varying signal. It's an analog thing. So it's not digital, just zero or five volts, true or false or binary. It's an analog signal. In the case of the LabJack here, these analog signals can be anything between plus and minus 10 volts. So in other words, you can send in anything between plus and minus 10 volts on these analog inputs here. And of course, that's all relative to these pins here, which are labeled ground. So you always have to send them in relative to ground, but that's what the LabJack is for. If you look at further inspection of the LabJack here, you see there's some power on here. There's plus 5 volts and plus 5 volts. These aren't very strong power supplies, meaning they can't supply a lot of current because they're coming right from the USB bus and the lab jack themselves, but they'll give you a few tens of milliamps if you just wanted to power something, maybe even a digital integrated circuit if you're lucky. But there is a voltage reference on these things, and yes, these voltage references can be routed right into an analog input for some testing. If you sort of keep looking then, you also see some things like this here. You see IO0, IO1, IO2, IO3. These are just input outputs again, and these are going to be your digital ones over here. So the digital ones refer now to signals that are plus or minus zero and five volts. That's what these are going to be for right here. So these are some digital inputs. And you see there's uh, four of those. So you have four digital inputs. So again, the power of the lab jack. Eight analog input channels. Four digital input channels. And if I continue on then, and I guess I should ref, uh, also emphasize that on these digital channels here, they can be configured as either input or output. That's what I.O. stands for, so input or output, digital in this case here. So they can actually read if a value is 0 or 5 volts or send out 0 or 5 volts, depending on what you want to do. There's some more ground terminals over here. And then if I look again here, I see some other ones labeled AO0 and AO1. These are analog outputs. So these are going to be sort of the complements of what these do, where these are analog inputs, these are analog outputs. So these things allow you to send a voltage out to the circuit or the real world that you happen to be uh, working in here. There's a few others in here. There's a ground and there's a counter on here. This actually will count digital pulses that are going in here. And there's a few other things which you can investigate yourself. But I think for this particular class in this lab here, the analog inputs... The digital inputs and outputs and the analog outputs are going to be the important ones from us. So what we sort of wired in here, which, which will be seed some of the lab view demonstration videos, which you can also watch here, is just a good old three-wire potentiometer here. So if you look at the way it's wired up here, I have one extreme side of the potentiometer screwed right into the 5 volt terminal. The other extreme side of the potentiometer on this green cable here going into ground. So I have the, the fixed ends or the extreme leads of the potentiometer between plus or minus 5 volts. The middle one or the wiper, say the variable part of the potentiometer on this wire right here is going right into analog input zero. So as I turn this potentiometer right here, the voltage on this middle wiper, which is going into analog input zero, is going to vary between zero and five volts. That's my supply voltage right here. So by wiring it this way, I have a, just an awesome, simple test case for working with lab view and interfacing with lab jack with a pretty simple voltage input. So as I run the lab view exercises that we're gonna work on to change this analog input here, I'm just gonna turn this knob right here, which is gonna vary the voltage on this middle wiper. So here's what we're going to do in this particular lab view tutorial. 
I'm going to show you how to plot a sine wave into a waveform graph, and then we're going to adapt that very easily, illustrating the power of LabVIEW, into something that reads a voltage actually from the LabJack device. So let's just get started then. First thing I'll need here is I'm going to go into my block diagram here, which I, where I do my programming. I'm going to pull down a while loop in here. I'm going to look under structures and go to while loop right here, because it's the type of program that I want to continually sample from the sine wave and or the LabJack to keep it running. So there's my while loop structure right there. The condition down here with a little stop sign is when the while loop should actually stop. And so I'm going to right click on that. And I'm just going to create a control for that. And if you look very carefully at the, what it's done now, it's a create a button over here in the front panel, which I'll be able to click to stop the program. But more importantly, if you look at the condition of the stop, if I right click on it once again, you can see that it's currently checked off as being stop if true. This means if the button is pressed, the while loop will exit, and so will the program. So anyway, we'll continue on then. What I'll do now is I'm going to get my sine wave um, calculator out here. So I'll go look under mathematics right here, and it's under elementary and special functions. I have to look under trigonometri trigonometric functions in here. I see sine right here. Now your lab, you might be a tad bit different. This is version 7.0, but one way or the other, if you hunt around in your palette, you should be able to find the block that calculates the sine wave for you. Now let me, let me illustrate something else very useful about LabVIEW. If I go up here and pull down the help menu, and I highlight this thing called show context help, what will happen is another window will pop up here that will always give me real-time help on the item I have the cursor over. So if I hold the cursor over this sine wave function right here, you can look up in the context help menu, and it clearly shows that if you pass a value x in, this particular icon will take the sine of x and then pass it back out. So I'll sort of leave that open so we can always, always sort of tell what wiring uh, scheme I might need for a given icon. So there's my sine function. And now to determine what x value I want to take the sine of, I'm going to look down here for this loop iterator called i right here. And this is just the index of the while loop. Starts at 0, then goes to 1, and then goes to, to 2, and just keeps counting up as the while loop iterates. I'll just wire that right into my sine function just like that. So I'll take the sine of the loop iterator. Of course, this will take the sine, and then this output wire right here, you can see it flashing up there in the context help, is actually the sine of x, or in this case, the sine of the loop iterator. That's exactly what I want to pass into my graph. So I'll go over here back to the front panel, and I'll right-click again here, and I see a different set of controls, but here's the graph right here. So I pick, on, pick up waveform chart and sort of grab that in. That'll give me a nice big graph that I can plot my sine wave data to. I'll make it a little bit bigger for you here. So I have a nice big graph area right here, and that's sort of in the, the visual front panel that I'll in interact with as the user of the program. If I go back to the uh, block diagram, I've seen that my the effect of my action of drawing that waveform chart has made this sort of block diagram version of it, and that's exactly what I want to wire my sine wave into. So this is it, the complete LabVIEW program then. It'll take the sine of the loop index and pass into a waveform chart. And you can see the context sense of help just following everything I do. There's the help on the waveform chart, for instance, here. There's help on the sine wave, and if I just hold it over the while loop here, something like right there, it even tells me help on the while loop right there. But in either case, the program is done. Let me go ahead and run it and see what I get. So I'll just run the program. If I stop button, of course, the program stops. Now, the program is running very quickly because it's running basically at the speed of the computer because it's just a, a very tightly compiled loop here. So what I can do to slow it down a bit is I can drop back in here into my uh, function again. I right-clicked again. I can click on timing right here, and I can just choose this watch here, which says wait. Now, if I just drag that wa right in my while loop here, then you can tell from the context help up there it's asking for the milliseconds to wait, and that'll be every iteration of the loop. So if I just sort of go to this input right here and right-click on it, I can create a constant. It initially is zero right there. I'll just go ahead and change it to 500, so wait 500 milliseconds, or about a half a second for each loop iteration. If I rerun my code now, go back to the front panel and rerun it, I can see that there's my sine wave coming in again, but it's much slower now because I'm waiting one half of a second per iteration through the loop. It's certainly a parameter you could play around with a bit. Let me stop it. And I'll even make it just go a little bit faster. Maybe I'll wait um, 75 milliseconds per iteration of the loop to get a little bit more action on here. So back to the front panel, and off we go. There's my sine wave now. So here's the point of this video here. This is something, the sine wave isn't something terribly useful, but let me show you the real power of LabVIEW now and what it can do. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to delete my sine function. I'm going to say, okay, the sine wave is nice, but it isn't really what I want to use in the lab. I'll hit Control-B on the Windows or Command-B on Macintosh to get rid of the broken wires. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click again, and I'm going to go into this area called Measurement I.O., or Instrument I.O., pardon me. And if I go in there, 
Uh, you'll have to look around for this, but under my instrument drivers panel right here, I see something called LabJack down there. Now, LabJack are those red interface boxes we have throughout the lab. And if I pick on that now or pick go into that, I see a whole bunch of things I can choose from. And in particular, I'll choose the one called E Analog In. It stands for Easy Analog In. I'm going to left click on that and just drag it right into about where my sign used to be. Now, if I look very carefully, there's a whole bunch of in, there's a whole bunch of wiring opportunities as shown by the context help up there. So what I have up there is just a bunch of stuff that I'm not even going to worry about right now. But if I look at that orange wire on the right, it says voltage. And that's the one I want to focus on right here. This wire right here. See how it's flashing there in the context help? This icon all by itself, every time it's called as it's run through the while loop, will read a voltage from the lab jack and send that voltage out on this pin. So if I just take that voltage and wire it into my waveform chart, now I have something conceivably pretty powerful. I am now sampling voltages from the lab jack and sending them to a waveform chart. And the program is essentially done. And this is the real power of LabVIEW. I just swapped out the sine function that calculates sort of a theoretical sine wave, and now I'm talking to a real instrument which I can interface with my real electronic circuit. So if I run it now, nothing much seems to be happening. There's my old sine wave. Now, I, you can't see this in the video, but I have a variable voltage source, a potentiometer actually on my lab jack. And what I'll do is I'm just going to start turning that. So as I turn this potentiometer, that one way I'm turning it as, as I'm speaking here, turning it up and down. Now I'll do really fast in both directions. Now I'll go up and hold it. Now I'll go down and hold it. You can see I'm clearly reading a real voltage in. Furthermore, the voltage seems to be between 0 and about 5 or 4.5 volts or so. So see, I've actually now interfaced the computer with software to a real instrument in the laboratory. And this voltage could be connected to just about anything. So it's an extremely powerful process that I'm doing right here. Let me just stop that again and look back at the code now. And that's one of the real powers of what we're doing here. We have all the software installed for it, and it's all ready to go. Let me just look one more time to remind you where you'll find that LabJack stuff. If I right-click on this thing and go into Instrument I.O. and Instrument Drivers here, and then back in the LabJack, there's a whole bunch of opportunities for interfacing with LabJack. The easiest ones to use are the ones called Easy Analog In for reading voltages, Easy Analog Output for outputting voltages. You can see how the context helps sort of change. And in particular, on this Easy Analog Out, Notice how the voltage now is on the left side indicating an input. So you can tell LabVIEW what voltage to send out to the lab jack, and you will see that voltage appear on the jumper block. There's some other ones which are important here, which is called Easy Digital In. These allow you to interface with the digital pins, just 0 to 5 volts, and Easy Digital Out. These four together, Easy Digital Out, Easy Digital In, Easy Analog Out, and Easy Analog In, are extremely useful, and you can do many, many things in the laboratory to interface the computer to your electronic circuit.